All right. Welcome, everybody. We are live at five. Welcome to Pure Dog Talks live podcast. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and I'm so excited that you guys have joined us. Well, we're waiting for everybody to hop on. I've got a couple items for the good of the order, as they say. Um, in case you haven't heard, uh, towards the end of last year, we launched a new exclusive perk for our patrons. Pure Pep Talk is a weekly text message that comes with a an upbeat, a fun, and educational tidbit, sort of links you back to some of our early, early episodes, trying to get people access to those, to that archived material on the website, right? You can sign up for the patrons group and the pep talk messages for as little as $5 a month. I mean, right? That's less than a fancy foo-foo drink at your favorite coffee stand per month. So to be a patron, to join the patrons group, for those of you who um, want to join and always are asking to join, you do have to sign up. You do have to pay money to be part of the group. And that's part of the deal. The The funds that we raise through this crowdsourcing campaign go to pay for the overhead for Pure Dog Talk. None of this money comes to me. It all goes to our producers and our website people and all the people that work to make Pure Dog Talk keep the MP3s rolling for you guys. All right. So P.S. If you haven't submitted your request for the Pure Dog Talk patrons badge that you can have added to your website, you can add to your social media, etc. Check your email. Natalie's going to get those out this week. So check it out, you guys. Always remember, the more support you give us, the more access you acquire. So there's that. Check it out on the website, puredogtalk.com backslash patron. We've streamlined a lot of the offerings for you guys. We've made a new patrons group. We've grown our all access group. And it is an amazing community of judges and breeders and experts and exhibitors all with the same goal, right? Because your passion is our purpose. So there you go. Okay, now on to planning your dog's campaign. It's February. It's February 7th. You guys are already behind. <laughs> so that's that's what I'm going to say. If you're thinking about campaigning your dog, tonight's topic is 100% on point and, and we already lost a step. So first off, be sure to check out the podcast that I talked about this eons and eons ago, episode number 24. So you guys can go to the website and check that out. Second of all, drop your questions in the chat. This is interactive. That's what the whole live part of the live podcast is about is so that you guys get to ask your very specific questions. If you've got a question, drop it in the chat and I'll answer it. So, all right, let's talk about planning a campaign. Let's talk about goals. And what I really want to do is walk us through how to set goals, how to identify your competition, how to create a budget, super important, how to draw a roadmap and reach the finish line once you've identified those goals. All right. So let's talk about it. How do you identify the competition? How much money is enough? And where am I going? And how the heck am I getting there? So what's your goal, you guys? Some people are going to have a goal to have a new champion or a new grand champion, maybe a ranked special right? I want to be ranked in the standings. 
maybe I want to win the breed at the national or breed at or at Orlando at the national AKC national championship. Set a goal. That is the very first thing you have to do with the understanding that if you set your goal, I, in order for me to be successful, I have to win the national. I'm saying that's one day out of 365. I, I like to aim high. I like to have goals, but I like to have goals that I'm relatively comfortable we can achieve. And so when I was a handler, people would say, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. I'm like, okay, that's great. We can aim for that. But let's talk about a goal that is longer term. Let's talk about a goal that we have some sense of being able to achieve that is not a complete one-off. And so that's my very first recommendation to you. I'm not saying don't have the goal of winning the national or don't have the goal of um of winning uh, breed at the AKC don't I'm not saying don't have those goals I'm saying add those to larger and broader goals <clears throat> if you have 12 months to um, work towards your goals and you have a variety of judges and a variety of places and a variety of competition, you have a much better chance of achieving those goals than if the only thing you want to do is pie in the sky, I got to win the national for my year to be successful. I've won the day before the national. I've won the day after the national. I've won best of opposite at the national, right? So in terms of goal setting, a, a, a single and finite item is not going to be your very, or a single and finite win is not going to be your best goal. There's just too many variables. Try and make it a broader goal and include, I would aim for, I would aim for breed at the national. I would aim for an award of merit. I would aim for breed at, at um, the AKC national championship. Pick your goal and aim for that. Pick wisely pick sensibly pick based on your budget your ability to travel your dog's quality oh yeah that's part of it so one of the things that we're going to do as we start talking about what's our goal we're going to talk about what's the dog i have and i'm going to get into this a little bit deeper uh, as we go through this, but look at your dog. Look at your dog and decide, is this a great dog of its breed that perhaps lacks a little bit of showmanship? Is this a great show dog that has enough type to get by? Those are two very different dogs and you're going to have very different goals. And so I will give you an example. Okay, you know how much I love storytelling, right? So I'm going to tell you a story of two different wire hair pointers. Um, they were not, uh, they were like cousins, right? So the sire of one and the dam of the other were litter mates. So they, they were pretty closely related uh, on my breeding, both wire hair pointers. One dog was a fabulous example of a German wire hair pointer, but he really thought dog shows were kind of dumb. And he was the number one dog in the breed, rarely defeated in the breed ring, and had maybe three group placements his entire career because he just wasn't flashy. He was a big brown dog, and he thought being in the dog show ring was kind of dumb. And I will contrast him with the dog I showed a couple years later, um, closely related, who was a good wire hair pointer. He was not. I, in my estimation, in my evaluation, as good a wire hair pointer, but he was an amazing show dog and he had electricity and he loved to be at the dog show and he loved to be the center of attention. And for that dog, we made it our goal to be the number one dog in all breeds. And so 
he had many, many group placements. He also won specialties. He also won the breed, but he didn't have as consistent a win-loss record at the breed level. But when he won the breed, he was successful in the group. He was a best in show winner, etc. So these are the kind of evaluations that you need to make about your own dogs before you can even start to decide what you're going to do if you're talking about a ranked champion. If you're talking about a champion, just straight up, I want to finish my dog. Um, there's evaluation involved in that, right? Does my dog meet the standard? Can I get to places that have competition? For a grand champion, if that's going to be your goal, that's something that should be, you know, pretty attainable for most folks based on the requirements of the grand championship system. You can earn points for a grand championship by going select, by going best of opposite. You have to win the breed with competition X number of times, but it isn't, you know, you don't have to win 28 best in shows in order to do that. So, so one of the things that I love about dog shows, and I think it's lost sometimes in translation, is that there is a level for everyone. Even in the most hyper-competitive breeds, you can have a Golden Retriever, a Doberman Pinscher, a Labrador. You can have breeds that are highly, a French Bulldog, right? Highly competitive. And setting a goal of getting a championship is something that most people can do on an owner-handled basis. Not every time, but with a decent dog and you put the effort into it, you can finish your dog. You can finish your dog's championship. That is a doable goal for roughly 90% of the community. There are people who physically are not able, and we're going to get into whether we should hire a handler or not, some of those things. But, but that's a doable goal. A grand champion, absolutely a doable goal. And, and it's after that that we start you know, making bigger and broader and more exciting goals, right? So, so establishing at the beginning of the year, which is right now, tonight, we're doing this tonight, decide what your goal is. That's what you need to do. And that's where you start. And you can't do anything else until you have started with a goal with the understanding that your goal may morph. You know, you may start the dog, find that it's not ready, right? It's not mature enough. It's not trained enough. It's grooming isn't quite there. And you're going to have to, maybe a dog that you had no idea was coming all of a sudden comes up out of the blue. You're like, I'm not getting by that. Right. So then you revise your goal. So with the understanding that goals are fluid, we need to set goals. Okay. So next up in the goal setting concept. If we're going to say that our um, goal of we are the champions of the world. Next slide, Natalie. <laughs> um, so a new champion, a grand champion, right? So our goal now and how we think about which dog shows we go to, how much travel we have to do, all of those things, we have to find competition for the breed. I saw a post from a friend of mine recently that he had to get a major on his dog by getting a group placement because there hadn't been majors in that breed, happened to be a Commodore, um, for an entire year. Wow. Okay. So count yourself lucky if you don't have a Commodore. Um, but realistically, there are a number of breeds for, for which that is actually a thing. You need to find breed competition if you are going to finish your championship. There have got to be majors, right? So you need to look at where are the specialties going to be, where are the supported entries going to be, get on social media, get on the phone, get wherever you need to go to figure out where your breed is going to have entries through the course of the year. And that will plan out. That's your goal. That's your roadmap right there. I want to finish my champion. I have to have... I have to have an entry. So I have to go to the dog shows where there will be an entry of my breed. 
And I think one of the things that people don't really realize um, that they might want to think about is that entries in given breeds differ, 100% differ throughout the country. And I always thought it was just shocking um, when I was showing dogs in Nebraska. I had moved from Washington to Nebraska and I was showing dogs and I had come from, I had come from Washington state where three of the top Springer Spaniels in the country on any given day were in the ring head to head every weekend. That was the reality that I lived when I was in Washington state and I moved to Nebraska and there were no Springers anywhere. I'm like, Wow. So as a, as a campaign thing, I called up my Springer people. I mean, really, you guys need to send me a Springer. There are none. <laughs> this dog could be, you know, competitive at the group level. <clears throat> so those kinds of decisions, where you are, where you go, our point schedules lower a state over. So if you live in Washington, Idaho and Montana are your friends, for example. Um, and there are many states uh, for which this is the case. And so look at that. Know what the, what the point schedule is in the states around you. Know where there are points. So if there aren't any, for example, Spinoni being shown in Oregon, you may have to go to Michigan, right? Where a lot of Spinoni are being shown. And so that kind of knowledge is part of your planning as you set your goals. Um, I got a quick question um, about how to decide <clears throat> whether to keep going with a grand champion in uh, owner handled um, or not. And I think that that is, that's a great question. And I think a lot of it's going to depend on your decision making about your goals, right? Do I want to be ranked in the national owner handled series? Do I want to have a grand champion platinum? So, okay. So, so that's that goal setting that we're doing tonight. Set your goals, know where you are. If you've achieved your goal by March, maybe you need to bump your goal up. If it's November and you're not even halfway there, you need to think maybe you took too big a bite of the apple, right? So, so those are the types of considerations. Um, if you've got a grand champion, and you're competing in the owner handled series, you're consistently going breed opposite or select you're getting, and you're going best owner handled, best of breed on a better than 50% basis. That's always how I would decide for my clients. The dog had to win enough to go forward in competition, had to win at least 50% of the time, or it was not worth the client's money. So if you're your own client and you're making those decisions, your dog needs to be winning at least 50% of the time and going forward into the owner handled group for you to think in this area against this competition, this dog is successful and it's worth carrying forward with the money that I have to work with. If you're below 50%, then you need to look at maybe going outside your area, going to a different area, looking at your judges more carefully, um, and if you're still below 50%, you need to decide that maybe this is, this is the level that this dog is capable of achieving. And, and those are super hard decisions. And, and I understand that. I respect that. There is no shade being thrown here. I've had a lot of clients over the years that I said, I'm sorry, this dog just isn't going to do what we thought it might, or, oh my God, this dog is like, this dog is winning and I didn't really expect it to. And who knows? And sometimes dogs take off when we don't really expect them to. Um, Natalie, you had a, you had a question up and I missed it from um, Gabrielle. Um, maybe you can drop it in the guest chat for me if you would, or maybe I'll check the regular comments. Wait. Um, okay. Hello everyone. I'm finally to your regular comments. I'm so excited. <laughs> Um, okay. So you guys are fabulous. I'm so excited to see everyone. Um, budgeting for shows is hard. Yes, it is. 
Okay, so Janet, campaigning for owner handled standings, would it be the same as for all breed or breed? A little bit different strategy for owner handled, and we're gonna get into that here in a minute. Um, Natalie's dropped some some previous episodes you guys should check out. Um yes, come to Montana. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> once a young dog is finished. So this is from Gabriella Thornburg. She asks, once a young dog is finished, how do you decide if you want to just do its championship or if you want to move forward? So Gabriella, I think a lot depends on the breed. I assume this maybe is either a wire hair pointer or an Australian shepherd, guessing. Um, dogs sometimes need maturity to be successful at a group level or at the breed level. So if you finish a dog and it's nine months old, probably you should go do like agility or obedience or hunt tests and let it grow up. Um, this is the kind of decision-making and every breed is different. Um, Wirehair pointers are often competitive at two to three years old. Spinoni are frequently not competitive until they're four to six. And so those are the types of things that it needs a mentor. It needs someone that understands your breed you need to look at the landscape is there an, a, um, a dog in my breed that's going to be running for the number one all breeds i don't probably want to spend my money going head to head with that that's silly i can wait until next year right so those are the kinds of decisions that you're going to start making once you finish a grand championship or or any of those things um so Gabriella, if you're, if you're just going for a grand championship, you know, a young dog can frequently pick up, you know, selects or any of those sorts of things. Um, and, and I'm more willing to do that with a young dog to aim for a grand championship than I am to aim for a serious campaign at the all breed level. Okay. Um, Okay. Never been a major west of the Mississippi in your breed, Kaylee. And I noticed that you just flew to Atlanta to find majors. So this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, exactly what I'm talking about. So finishing your championship, finishing your grand championship, you have to have an entry in your breed. If you're in, you know, Lincoln, Nebraska, and there's not a Springer Spaniel to be found, you're going to have to travel. You're going to have to go to Michigan or Illinois or some of the places that other people will be sh competing with their springers. The other piece of this that's sort of oh, esoteric, if you will, is knowing your breed well enough, knowing and understanding the, the faults and virtues of your own dog well enough to know where should I compete? So if I have, um, I'll just give you, I'll use wire hairs because it's so much easier. I have a really dark tick dog. It's kind of fieldy, if you will, right? Looking, doesn't carry a ton of coat. It's not very fancy. It's real super sound, carries a hard back. It's just, it's just a, a what we call a plain brown wrapper. I'm not going to go show that dog in Florida. I mean, like I'm not. I'm going to show that dog in Northern California where it looks like the rest of the dogs, or I'm going to show it in Oregon or Washington or Idaho, or maybe even Texas. Um, know where your dog excels and where it fails. Know where in the country the breed looks like yours and doesn't. Um, and that is hugely imperative when you start making decisions about where you're going to show your dog, whether it's to finish it or to campaign it at a, at a higher level. Um, Larissa, absolutely. Waiting until the current number one dog isn't actively campaigning is probably the best bet. Yeah. Unless you got more money than they do, which I never had. So if somebody's, if somebody's pushing hard for number one in your breed and they want to be number one in the terrier group, or they want to be number one, all breeds, just let them do that. Like, you know, maybe you'll knock them off once or twice, but you're going to spend a whole lot of money pounding your head against the wall. And it's, 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 I get it. And, and if you're working towards your grand championship or you're working towards owner handled, those are fine things, but it, I think it is important and incumbent upon us to recognize what our budgets are, what our dogs are capable of doing, what we, 
are capable of doing and being realistic. And instead of trying to pound your head against the wall or run through that brick wall like the mule, maybe go around it, right? Like go to a different area, Um, wait a year. Your dog's gonna look better anyway. Um, Those are the kinds of things that, that I think are hard decisions sometimes to make and you see this dog come up out of the woodwork, you're like, no, no, it was my turn, right, Stella? But, but my point is sometimes these things happen and, and sometimes we have to revise our goals and our plans based on the sometimes these things happen. Um, okay, Charlotte has a question. Charlotte hints, do you have any strategic changes for sending out a bitch in a strongly male dominated breed this bitch has beaten some boys, but bitches winning in our breed is not the norm. And she doesn't beat the major male players. I, you know, I come from a breed where bitches are really successful. So that's a hard one for me. Um, in terms of strategy, I am always going to say, if you have a good dog that is of quality and has the virtues that are needed, be willing to go head to head. Don't shy away, but be realistic and say, you know, I can maybe do that one weekend a month, but the other times, if I'm going to have any chance in hell, I'm going to have to kind of go around that. Right. So, so that strategy is going to be, if it's a big weekend with a lot of entries and it's worth the effort to try and, and you know, the judging panel and you're like, you know what, this bitch is absolutely right up so-and-so's alley. Go for it. There are judges in our sport who love to put up bitches. Know who they are. If you need to know, you can ask me in a private message. <laughs> okay. So know who those people are. And, and if you've got a great bitch, know who to take her to. Um, and know when and how to do that. So yes, it is, it is a little bit of a different strategy, Charlotte. But um, the biggest part of it is, again, knowing your individual dog strengths and weaknesses and those of the competition and being very realistic. No rosy glasses about that. Um, yeah. And Susan, we're going to get to that in a minute. I'm, I'm like, keep answering questions and not getting to my slides. (laughs) Um, Oh, Larissa, this is such a great question. I love this. Larissa wants to know for a bitch, would you campaign before or after a litter? So I'm going to give you both sides of this coin. I'm going to say that it absolutely depends on the breed. There are some breeds that will hold up to it better than others. Um, But I will tell you that, um, for example, the Spinoni that I showed, whose name was Adele, who was very famous. She was the first best in show winning female Spinoni. Um, Her owner wanted to breed her before she was campaigned. And she was coming off of two group wins under you know, Ed Biven and Peggy Beisel, people that I really respected. She absolutely was hell bent. This bitch was going to be bred. I'm like, no, you're killing me, right? I'm the dog handler. No, you're killing me here. And she bred the bitch. She got opposite at the national while pregnant um, and had her puppies lost that year and came back the following year and won a bust and show and went on to win the breed at the garden and, and like a, you know, group five. I am very glad that we bred her when we did. She had four litters. One was a singleton. So three total litters. Um, but you run into problems like I did with my wire hair pointer bitch that I campaigned that I bred her four times. I only got two litters. I lost the first one. I had one good one. The third one was resorbed. The fourth one I had to, um, spare on the table during a c-section because she had a torsion uterine horn and so this was a very top winning very successful very high flying bitch that i only was able to get two litters out of because i showed her before i bred her so my experience my passion my um suggestion to you is if you really desperately believe that this bitch is going to contribute to the gene pool you need to breed her first. Even if it means you might lose your top line a little bit, even if it means you lose a year, even if it means whatever, because as breeders, 
That's why we're doing this. We are not at a dog show to win ribbons. We are at a dog show to make better dogs in our breeds. And that's what our bitches are for. And we can't continue to make better dogs if we don't have good bitches to breed from. And so if we believe that this bitch is of value to the gene pool and of, uh, of value to the breed, she should be bred before she's campaigned. This is what I have come to after many years and a lot of really bitter, painful, hard experience. So my recommendation for you. Um, okay. We're going to get to professional handlers. Would you be happy with best opposite 50% of the time, Susan? It depends on the breed, but personally, no, I would not. Um, for what I was intending, it depends on your goal. If you want to have a ranked top winning special, 50% of the time, best opposite isn't going to get you there. Um, but it's tough. You know, if we're talking about best opposite with a bitch to a dog in a breed, like say, for example, Gordon Setters, Susan, I know that's one of your breeds. Um, it's tough to beat a, a Gordon dog with a Gordon bitch. That's a breed where the, the sex differences are really, really challenging. So, I mean, it just is going to have to depend on what you've set your goals for. Uh, Cheryl says that last year, her under two-year-old dog surprised us with being number one, all breed. Whoop. Hello. Um, decided to campaign him this year. Now there's so much pressure. I know, honey. How do you keep the joy in campaigning and not feel so much pressure? Oh my God. What a great, great, great question. All right. I, I may skip the slides entirely and just keep answering y'all's questions. This is fabulous. Cheryl, it's not just you. Mostly it's the dog. And so here's my suggestion. When I was, even when I was in big campaigns, now I will admit that I never campaigned for a top 10 um, in the group. So that's a whole nother, we're going to set that aside. If you're campaigning to be number one in your breed, either all breed or breed, um, number one on our handle, all of that, depending what you're campaigning for. I physically could not, like my health is such, I couldn't show dogs for weekends a month, every month of the year. I made a point of finding weekends I could take off, whether it was, there was no uh, panel near me that was worth going to, um, whether it was the dog needed a weekend to go swimming, making the dog the most important part of this equation is what matters. Set your goals. Um, I'm going to tell you another story. Okay. I know you guys just get a little crazy when I go off on my squirrel stories, but this one is worth telling in response to Cheryl's question. Um, the first Spinoni that I campaigned was a dog by the name of Spamonte. He was a wonderful, beautiful, fabulous dog who I adored. But he was, as many Spinoni are, not really perfectly suited to being a top special. And his owner wanted to show him as a special and campaign him after he finished his championship. And I told her flat out, I will show this dog until he tells me he's done. And we had the funding for this. We, I had a two year run with this dog and I took him to the garden and I showed him at the garden and I drove him across country to do it from Oregon to New York and back. And the dog was done. The dog told me he was done. He was physically, mentally, and emotionally over it. He'd had it. He did not want to do it anymore. That was in February. I was supposed to show the dog through May at the national and I stopped in Utah on the way off and said, it's not worth it. This dog is done with this. We have to as owners, as breeders, as handlers, as whoever it is, we have to understand that the dogs have to come first. And if we cannot make that decision, we have no business playing this game. I don't care who you are. I gave up a lot of money, but that was the right thing to do for that dog. And we all need to put that in the forefront of our thinking when we decide what we're going to do with our dogs. Be willing to cut bait. Um, Cheryl, and, and if you're the one that's crazy and not the dog, I, you know, I feel like that's probably the same thing. 
right? Like you need to decide for yourself how much value it brings you. How crazy are you willing to make yourself? Um, if you believe strongly enough in the process, I strongly recommend surrounding yourself with really, really supportive people, not doing anything other than focusing on you and the dog and blanking everything else out. It's real easy to get caught up in the, for lack of a better word, happy horse shit that dog shows can bring to us. Uh, don't let the turkeys get you down as a thing. Focus on you, focus on your dog. If the dog's happy and you can hold it together, then that's what counts. If you can't, if it's making you too crazy, I mean, you know, buy a tiara, go on a cruise. We're supposed to be doing this because it's fun. And if we're not having fun do it, doing it, we need to find a way to make it fun or we need to quit doing it. So my encouragement is find a way to make it fun. Make bets with yourself. Have a friend. Have a stable pony for you. I've had stable ponies for dogs. <laughs> have a stable pony for you. Um, and remember that we're really, really, really not solving world peace here. We are not curing the Palestinian Israeli problem. We're not making, we're not blowing up Chinese balloons. Okay. We're showing dogs and it should be fun. And, and we do have some control over how much we allow it to get to us. So that would be my strong recommendation. Make it fun for you and the dog. Um, okay. Let Oh, I'm sorry. The sound cut out. I hope it came back. Are we good? My sound on my end says we're good. Uh, Natalie, if I'm having problems, shoot me a message somewhere. Okay. Find a way to make it fun. Yes. Okay. All right. We got a little bit distracted. Where are we? Rankings. Okay. Are we ready for rankings, Natalie? Excellent. So breed, we just talked to a lot about this breed, all breed, group, all of those. There's all kinds of places you can rank your dog. You can talk about ranking a dog in junior showmanship. I mean, there's, it's one of the things that I personally find as a distraction in AKC dog shows is this constant fixation with rankings. I have to be number one. And as a handler, I, I was very focused on it. Trust me, I get it. Um, but I do feel like we can lose sight of the dogs in the quest for the madness. So I caution against that. Um, if you want to make your, we talked about this a little bit, Timmy and Luca, right? Uh, if you want to make your dog number one in the breed, you need to go find entries. You need to find where there's going to be a lot of dogs entered in your breed and you need to win those, right? You need to know what your dog is and what the competition is. Know where to go in the country. Um, I was a fellow in, in one of my breeds that flew out to Portland because that was a, a better entry and he felt like he had more chance for success there than closer to home. Those are the sort of decisions that you need to make um, for the breed, for all breed. If you want to be the number one dog of your breed in all breed, you're counting the group placements, right? So you want to go where you have groups with judges that you believe will look kindly on your breed, on your dog, will what have you right? So it's, you need to look at the distances that you're going to have to travel. How much money do you have, right? Um, is the number one dog of all breeds liable to show up at this dog show? Maybe find a different one. Some parts of the country, it's a lot easier to go different directions than others. I mean, if you live in Virginia, you can travel three hours and be in six different states. If you live in Oregon, you can travel three hours and not be to the dog show. So that's a thing to keep in mind. Um, I did a lot of traveling to, I'm in Southern Oregon. I went to Northern California. I could go to Nevada. I could go to Idaho. I didn't have to go to Oregon or Washington. Just sort of depended on the dog I had and the type of competition I was looking at. Um, owner handled, uh, the, the points accrue for owner handled a little bit differently. So, you know, think about that. Yep. Yeah, the uh, Janet 
has a great point. Janet Oatney says that for owner handled, you want to go where there are fewer dogs as points in groups are same for small shows as large ones. And I think that that's a really great point to make for people that are really looking to in the owner handled level. Um, okay. So here's, here's next up in the rankings. You want to be ranked in the, in the group level. So I want to be the number, I want to be a top five sporting dog, for example, uh, which is something that we achieved with our Spinoni Josie last year. Um, and I'm going to say in answer to that, you probably need more money. I mean, realistically, if you're sitting here on a Tuesday night watching my podcast, you probably, <laughs> you probably need more money. Um, so Susan's comment, how do you find a sponsor for the dog you want to special? And when you find a sponsor, what do they usually want in exchange is very apropos to this particular point on my, on my um, PowerPoint here, which is if you want to be ranked at the group level, you need to find more money. Uh, finding a sponsor is not something that you do just like at the snap of the fingers. Typically and generally speaking, sponsors come with specific handlers. It's a fact. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to pick on or, um, exaggerate anything, but I can tell you that, um, the times that I had really successful dogs, um, if they owners wanted that dog to have a backer, um, most of the time they had to go to a different dog handler. So some of those clients agreed to that and my dog went away to a different dog handler. Um, or, and some of the times the owners figured out a way to, to manage it on in a small group of their friends and compatriots. Um, I, you do you, man. <laughs> I will caution anyone out there having been down this road more times than I care to discuss. Um, there is such a thing as selling your soul to the devil and wanting to succeed badly enough that you agree to something that is not in yours or the dog's best interest. And so be aware of that is what I would say. Know that the dog always has to come first. And, you know, if you, if you are inclined to say, I want to be associated with a big winner and you're, comfortable with where the dog will be shown and how the dog will be shown and who's going to show the dog, then do it. Absolutely. I mean, there's some great handler teams out there. And if you've got that amazing dog that the fancy should see, they should see what a, you know, spectacular twizzle hound looks like. Do it. But just know that it might not always go exactly the way you think it's going to. So, um, so, uh, thanks Natalie. <laughs> um, we are moving on to our next slide. It, it looked like our slides might've been, um, taken over by demons, but I think it was just Natalie accidentally <laughs> hitting the, the mouse. So this is where I think is a good point to talk about our, um, how, who shows the dog, right? Um, it is exhausting, Charlotte. I, I've campaigned dogs even at a, at a minuscule level of what is available and it is absolutely exhausting. Um, I have good friends who have run for um, top dog in their group or top dog all breeds and including a dog that, that I had some involvement with this last year and it's exhausting. It, there's no question about it. And so there's a reason they call those dogs special. They should also call their owners special, the owners, the handlers, all the people involved with a dog that's competing at the level of top 10 or top five in their group. Those, those people are cut from different cloth than, than just, you know, the average run of the mill person. And that's okay and more power to them. I'm not that person I never was. I didn't want to be. Um, and it is exhausting. But if you have that special unicorn that you would like to see move up in the world, we can talk about owner handled, which I understand is what most of us do. 
and professional handling, which is what I used to do. If you're going to show your own dog and if you're going to take it to, yeah, Texas is like Oregon and Washington entirely. We could put Oregon and Washington in Texas and, and still have room. Um, if you're going to show your own dog and expect to be ranked beyond your breed. In other words, if you think that you're going to run for the roses, you're going to go to be ranked in the top 10 in your group. If that's going to be your goal, I would encourage you to have, um, six figures laying around that you don't need to spend on anything else. Um, either a very flexible job or no job and a really thick skin. So you can show your dog to a championship. You can show your dog to number one in owner handled. You can show your dog to number one in the breed. You can show your dog to number one, all breed. You can do all of those things as an owner handler very successfully. Um, you can show your dog to be ranked in the groups. It just takes a level of commitment that not everybody has. And that's why I talked about setting goals. If you set your goal for one thing and, and it's going to kill you, then, then there's no fun left. Set your goals that you can achieve. And if you believe that you can achieve having your dog ranked in the group, then do it. But know that it's a lot of work. Um, money, time, and a thick skin. Yeah, buddy. Um, showing your own dog, you get, it's your dog. It's the fun that you have with your dog. I showed, um, early on in my handling career before I was uh, famous or anything else, I showed, um, a dog that my mom and I, my mom bred and she and I owned, and that was my first best in show dog. And, and we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun, had a lot of good time with that dog. Um, if you're doing it on your own, it might cost more. I know that sounds a little bizarre, um, but when you have a handler, you have to pay the handler, but you don't have to take time off work. You don't have to go to the dog show yourself. And um, the handler may be able to access shows, entries, panels, all the things that you just can't. And they may very well have more success in the amount of time and the money amount of money that you have available than you could necessarily have on your own. If you can handle the dog on your own, go for it. I a hundred percent believe it, support it, encourage it. But here's the deal. Don't think you're getting beat because handler, right? You have to out handle the handlers. You have to out groom the handlers. You have to out evaluate the other dogs in the ring than the handlers. You have to know what's good and bad about your dog, what's good about about their dog, and know if you should win or lose, and when you should win or lose. Um, you need to know the judges and what they like. You need to have acquired the same amount of knowledge that a handler has, or have someone feeding it to you, <laughs> one or the other. Um, because handlers don't just win because they're handlers, they win because they have the handling skill, the grooming skill, the ability to get to places, the ability to evaluate their charge and the other dogs in the ring, and they know what the judges like in every breed. And that is an advantage to the handler. And so if you expect to beat the handlers, you have to be as good as them in all those areas. And that's just a fact. Um, professional handling, you may get to your goal faster. It might cost less. You have to, you're sharing your expenses with a bunch of other people on the truck. Um, um, you don't have to take time off work. You don't have to drive there. No five bucks a gallon in the, in the diesel rig for you. Right. So it, it's a thing <clears throat> you have to weigh that against your dog's going to be away from home. You just have to look at what your goals are, what your budget is and what your time is like. As Susan said, um, she has a job to support her dogs. <laughs> um, if you're going to hire a handler as someone who did this as a living for 25 years, I know all the people in it. I know who I would hire and who I would not. I strongly recommend that you start with uh, a list of PHA handlers in your area and a list of AKC registered handlers in your area and talk to them. 
I strongly encourage you to go to dog shows, watch the people that interest you and they watch them behind the scenes, watch their setups, watch their trucks, watch them in the ring, watch them. I had somebody come up to me at one point that told me they'd been watching me for five years and I'm like, wow, stalker much, but that's what is entailed. And that's what people need to feel comfortable to send their dogs with you. So know that it is a lot more than running around in left-handed circles in a St. John's suit and shiny shoes. It really is. Animal husbandry is critical and you need to feel comfortable. If you're going to send your dog with a handler, you had best feel comfortable with that person. My strong recommendation for you. All right. Next up budgeting. This is the big one. I know it's what everybody's been waiting for. There's still 30 some of you here. I'm saying budgeting is the piece and, and it's real. And the budget's going to depend on whether you're doing it yourself or hiring a handler. But there's some things that are going to be across the board. You have to pay to enter the dog entry fees these days are anywhere from 30 to 35 to even $40 a day. And you've got a five day weekend and you got four of those this month. Ching, ching, ching. Somebody just do the math on that. Photos. You're going to want photos. You're going to want wind photos. You're going to want candid photos. You're going to want all the photos you can get a, because it's fluffy and you want to have pictures of fluffy because fluffy is fabulous. And I get that, but you're also going to want to have photos for next, please advertising. And I think that one of the things that has changed probably the most in my time in this sport, from when I started in dogs in the early eighties to today, the single most impactful change in that time is that our ads don't just have your win photo and thank you judge and sire and dam and owner and handler and we're done. Okay. You can see here, Timmy, this is one of the candid photo shoots I had done with Timmy candid photos. Advertising is much mm, more free form than it once was. Um, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, watch the handler, watch the assistance is 100% right. Because in many cases, the assistants spend more time with the dogs than the, than the handlers do. Um, Ingrid's question, what do you do if you aren't crazy about the handler, but the dog loves the handler? Um, fortunately, this is my, um, thought on that Ingrid, God gave us a brain to make those decisions, to keep our dogs safe. Um, there are, there are some dogs and some individual dogs, some breeds of dogs. I might trust their judgment over mine but not very many. So that's what I would say to that. Um, so advertising, you need some, some candidates, you need to, you know, find out who the candid photographers are. You need to talk to them. You need to pay them always. So before I get any further in this, can I just say always, 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 always pay your bills. If you can't pay your bills, don't do the campaign, pay the advertiser, pay the handler, pay the magazine, pay the handler, pay the photographer, pay all the people. If you can't pay them, don't do the gig. It's not fair. All those people put in lots of time, lots of energy, lots of work. If you don't like your photo, you know, use a handler that, or use a photographer that lets you see your photos before you buy them. I, you know, pay people. It, it really is that important. Um, so advertising entries, like I say, 35, maybe $40 a whack photos, your win photos, your candidates are going to be anywhere from 40 to 50 bucks a whack. You could buy, you know, anywhere from two to 10 of those in a weekend. Um, my strong suggestion on absolutely true, Susan. Um, my strongest suggestion on photos, if you are at the level of campaigning your dog, do not get a photo for every breed win. Dear God, you can go broke in a hot second. At that point, once you get to the point, your dog's a champion, it's a grand champion, whatever you've, 
you photographed those win photo milestones, you take pictures of your group placements and that's all you take pictures of. Um, get your candidates um, and and have a, a couple good group win photos and, and quit taking photos other than group placements. I have had dogs over the course of time. I didn't take a photo that wasn't a group one. That I mean, realistically, there has to be a place that you just say, I can't spend any more money. So every team, every client, every handler, every owner, whatever, has to make their own decisions about how to do that. Breed wins at the national or a super fancy judge. Absolutely, Janet, 100%. But just, you know, a, I, a breed a photo from every best of breed win and you were the only dog, please don't do it. You will go broke in a heartbeat. Um, advertising, you know, the thing to keep in mind, we've got three primary magazines, right? We have Dog News, we have the Canine Chronicle, we have Show Sight. We also have like American Can uh, American Dog Fancier and I think Canadian Dog Fancier, right? The online magazines. Those are pretty much where you're going to be limited to advertise. You can do some promotion on your own social media with the understanding that that works if you have an audience that is a lot of judges and even then it doesn't always work. Um, don't tag judges. Do not, do not, do not, do not tag me. Do not tag anyone. Do not tag judges when you take a one photo and post it on your social media. I am very thrilled. I would love it if you sent me a private copy of that photo, but the American Kennel Club's um, social media policy, we get in big trouble when you guys do that. So don't feel like the judges are being mean to you. We don't want to get in trouble with the American Kennel Club. And there's, you know, a legitimate ethics concern with that. So if you have a win photo with a judge that you happen to be friends with on social media, please, 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 please do not tag them. If it's a beautiful photo, if they've made extra nice remarks about you or your dog or what have you, feel free to send them a hard copy in the mail. You can get their address at the AKC um, Judges Resource Center. Uh, judges Directory will have mailing address. You can email it to them. You can private message it to them if you happen to have them on social media. But please do not tag judges on social media. Um, okay. So advertising in the magazines. Um, I worked with a lot of great designers and photographers over the years and have come to respect their knowledge. Um, Natalie dropped a bunch of uh, links earlier that will give you some insight from talking to a couple of them. My strongest thing is if you're going to put an ad in, it's better you put a two page ad every other month than a one page ad once a month. Color versus black and white, unless you have the skill set, the design skills, the photography skills, whatever, to make black and white stand out. Um, always, if you can get an edge, be a loyal customer, whatever it is, get towards the front of the book. Um, Dog News is a publication that I really love. I think that they have a great deal of reach. Their audience is very much East Coast. Um, very much old school judges. So if you have a panel coming up that 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 the judges fit that uh, model, that's a, a magazine to consider. They also are published weekly. So if you have a big win, you want to get it out quick, that's a great way to do it. Um, the other magazines have different audiences, different markets, etc. Um, you know, the American Dog Fancier, it's online. Maybe it doesn't have quite as much reach, but it is lower cost. But you're, you know, once you start advertising, you're talking about a thousand bucks a whack, easy by the time you buy the photo, buy the design, buy the ad. Um, so that's a piece of it. Food, fuel, are you flying? Hotel rooms, you have to take time off work. All of this goes into your budgeting um, when you start talking about campaigning your dog. So as I said at the beginning, Yes, ADF, Janet, I agree. They do nice work at a reasonable cost. Um, I, I really, I really like Jess. I really like the work that they do at ADF. Um, and I really do like um, Dog News and Charlotte, absolutely working herding dog digest. Um, James Taylor's publication, if you happen to own a working or herding breed, he does a beautiful job. 
um, I would I would say those would be my three. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, so that's what I have for you guys. Um, we've reached the end of our time. I've reached the end of my slides. Merry Christmas, hallelujah. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, campaigning a dog is a lot of fun. Sometimes it's a once in a lifetime thing. Sometimes it is an every other year thing. I mean, it just depends on what you want to do and how committed you are to it. But um, the thing that I would take away, you know, speaking to Cheryl's point, speaking to a lot of people's points, if it's not fun, there's other places we can spend our money. So have fun, make it fun, make it fun for your dog. Go do touristy things, right? Um, lay on the bed and watch Netflix between the show and the group, you know, whatever it is, find a way to make it fun. Keep it fun for your dog. Do all the things that make your dog happy. Um, our Spinoni from last year, you know, her thing was she had to sleep in the bed, right? Like whatever it is, find that thing, find your joy and find your dog's joy. All right. Thanks y'all. Have a great night. Don't forget puredogtalk.com backslash patron. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>